What's next in fashion? How do we solve the sizing issue? Why should true personalisation be on all our to-do lists? It's the e-commerce master plan podcast here to help you solve your marketing problems and grow your e-commerce business. Cutting through the hype to bring you inspiration and advice from the e-commerce sector and beyond. Here's your host, Chloe Thomas. Hello and welcome. It's great to have you here. In today's episode, I am chatting with a UK fashion retailer of amazing pedigree. And we are going to be getting into the sort of things you should be thinking about for 2022. We'll be talking about personalization. We'll be talking about dealing with the sizing issue in retail, that big source of all of all the fashion sustainability problems, which is getting customers to buy the right product in the first place without actually seeing it. And we'll be talking about how the customer is now the biggest disruptor in the industry. Whilst this is fashion focus, there is a lot in this episode that's going to apply to many other businesses. And it's really, it's going to get those gray cells thinking, but not put too much on your to-do list. Before we get into all that though, please do check out the sponsors. This podcast is brought to you by Klaviyo, the email and SMS marketing platform that helps you send messages like an e-commerce expert, even if you're just getting started. Create your free account at klaviyo.com slash masterplan. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash masterplan. Shopware is a leading e-commerce system and used by some of the largest European brands, retailers and manufacturers across B2C and B2B industries. As a trend-setting open source solution, Shopware gives retailers the freedom to quickly and easily realise their growth potential with more flexibility and less complexity. Today, more than 100,000 companies from startups to enterprise rely on a Shopware solution, generating a combined turnover of 12 billion euros in 2020 alone. Start your business for free and visit www.shopware.com forward slash masterplan. And now to introduce today's special guest. Sarah Curran, MBE, has a phenomenal history in fashion retail. Founder of My Wardrobe, four years at director level at Shop Direct, that's very.co.uk, and non exec director at French Connection. Right now, she is the managing director EMEA at TrueFit, the world's largest connected data set for fashion that's helping retailers improve customer experience and sustainability. Hello, Sarah. Hi. Hello. Great to have you on the show. Someone with your depth of fashion knowledge, this is going to be, um, I know we have a lot of fashion retailers listening, so um, I'm sure they're they're going to be hanging on your every word. But before we get into kind of what they should be doing now and what they should be doing in the future, how did you get into this world of of e-commerce? So my journey to e-com was via sort of my opening of a um, of a store, fashion store in North London. I left the Times. Uh, I've been at News International for something like five or six years and I felt the time was up. I wanted to go and do something completely different and an opportunity came up for me to open a fashion store, which became a bit of a destination store in London. Fast forward sort of 18 months where I was living in France with my husband and um, son. And really, we wanted to expand the, the fashion business and expanding it online made more sense to us than opening up more sort of bricks and clicks uh, across the UK. So that's when I launched, we launched my wardrobe in 2005. So I've been in retail since 2002, but with a real strong focus on digital and e-com since 2005. And it's very much my sweet spot. It was a big move to do in 2005 to go, we're going to do the the online route and double down on that. Did it feel like a big move at the time? I think 
like many things, sometimes being oblivious in terms of how <laughs> easy or hard something is going to be is a better position to be in than knowing the challenge ahead. Because at that time, it's fair to say e-com was really very young in its foundation from an adoption perspective and, and the customer shopping online, there was still, you know, debates about online security and, you know, look out for the the padlock at uh, in the URL at, at checkout, et cetera. Um, so adoption and usage of, uh, of online was, was really slow, but we were living in France and I was buying I was spending a lot of money on net, even though I had my own fashion store in North London. So we were starting to see that real move um, with customers starting and, and purchasing from grocery departments in Ocado. Net and ASOS were really sort of gaining traction. My husband at the time, we made a kind of a great partnership in the sense that he was the real I guess, operational person. And I had that sort of the creative look and the relationship with the brands. And so it was this perfect partnership. And it was such a ride. It was exhilarating. It was everything. It was also exhausting. It took down my marriage. It was, you know, it was, it certainly wasn't just all kind of, all sort of, um, amazing amazing sort of days it was it was super intense yeah it was a, it was an exciting time to be in e-commerce but everything was so much harder than it is now <laughs> totally and i remember we were living in saint emilion in the southwest of france it's a real sort of wine region and our house um was in the middle of vines and an old sort of wine sort of chateau in the the, the back area was where we held all our stock. And so we would have deliveries from DHL or, you know, sort of um, TNT and FedEx and stuff. And they would deliver it. They were so confused because it was, you know, it looked like a, a normal wine property. Uh, we'd open the, um, the warehouse doors and it was just rails and rails of clothes. Um, there, were, there was no handbook to e-com or e-tail as it was called back then. So we really lived by the pain and the mistakes and returns. There's an irony, the fact that, you know, I have come full, full circle in terms of living and breathing the pain. There was no evident solution for returns. So everything was super manual and returns weren't, it wasn't a concept I'd grasped you know we would send out our orders and then all of a sudden I started to see orders come back and I was like what on earth is happening and then of course you know because I had the 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 store in London I was like okay so this is essentially the equivalent of the customer you know being in in store going into the changing room it's just now that the changing room is wherever she is receiving the orders and we had to allow and model in the returns rate um, in our financials. And, you know, that is still very much the case for many brands and retailers. So um, it's sort of th this thing that, that really sort of um, sparked this passion of solving the, the issue for the customer and also the retailer um, in, you know, in the hot seat as a retailer was so uh, is now sort of something that I do um, for a living. You're bringing us nicely on to talk about TrueFit, which we'll do in a second. But I just want to clear one thing up, which may be niggling at the back of uh, people listening's head, which is you mentioned Net a couple of times earlier, and I'm assuming that's Netta Porter? Yes, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, Netta Porter. I can just feel a couple of the listeners just going, what's Net? I don't, I've never heard of Net. Or just let them concentrate on what you're saying rather than worrying about that one. Um, so you've moved from being kind of deep on the, the retailer side of things to being on the supplier side with a fascinating business. Um, tell us a bit about TrueFit and, and what you guys do. Yeah, so TrueFit was the first size and fit solution of its kind. So they invented essentially the the sort of the technology and the the solution, um, as it were, back in uh, two thousand and two thousand and five. 
And during that time, the business has built and grown to hold the world's largest data set for fashion and footwear and apparel globally. And in that time, over the last sort of 15 plus years, the um, what we know and call the genome, which is very much the brains behind the platform, um, has, you know, we've transacted on over $200 billion worth of sales and returns. And, you know, we have over 200 million uh, registered global members and we work with about 17,000 brands globally and 250 partners, retail partners as well, uh, who use the, the technology. And so what we, what we do essentially is we are a one-to-one size and fit personalization solution provider. So we work with the likes of Bowdoin in the UK or Ralph Lauren and um, Nordstrom in the US and Seven for Mankind, sort of uh, large global brands. And we essentially play the role of giving the, the shopper and the customer their own normalized size, dependent on which brand and retailer they're on. The challenge that we have as an industry, sometimes we need to sort of just take a step back to sort of see the the issue that that we have. If you think before that we really had the acceleration in digital and e-com, we always knew as a fashion industry that sizing was always a problem. And, you know, we we would there would be frequent sort of um, programs about um, how can I be a size eight in um, River Island and a size 12 in when I go to Topshop. You know, there was such a, there was no normalized size specification. It was very much dependent on the, the high street brand. And also within the high street brand, very much dependent on where that item is manufactured. Uh, because there there are sort of various inconsistencies of size, so we know as an industry this has been a big problem. Now, once we we sort of establish this as something that you know has been ongoing for a long time, once you add in the challenge and the complication of digital acceleration, uh, twenty twenty, the you know majority of uh, physical stores closing down, pretty much across the world. So the, there's a real sort of skew in the contribution of revenue coming from digital. And if you have a brand or a retailer that still has not sorted out their size and fit issues, essentially you've, you're causing your operational team and your fulfillment team a huge headache. And also you're causing your finance director or CFO a huge headache because you're going to start seeing sort of some losses from an operational perspective and um, also challenges from operational margin and, and being able to sell at full price. So really what we have now is because of this huge acceleration with customers buying online, we now are seeing this um, suddenly everyone's like, okay, we, we need to solve properly for size and fit. The generalized size advice is no longer adequate where, you know, you can see 20% of customers bought a size extra small and, you know, the the rest bought sort of, uh, you know, the size either side of that is no longer really adequate. People want a much better personalized recommendation. And also the customer doesn't want it to be left to them to solve for. Yeah, it's kind of the... You know, you say you, you, we go back and fashion's always had this sizing issue. And in a physical retail store, the sizing issue is less of a problem because the customer is trying on the product there and then. I mean, you know, I know when I'm out in the physical stores, I'm inevitably taking a 10 and a 12 in every single time if, if it's on the rack because I want to see which one looks best. And that's the only only way to do it, even in brands that I, you know, that I know and love. And that we can't do that online. So the consumers who are on your platform, when they go onto the retailers who are on your platform's um, website, are they getting like a, a I don't know a pop up that says 
you should buy the 12 in the in these trousers or you should buy the 14 in this top yeah so the the great thing about truefit is that we work as a network so all our partners retail partners and brand partners are connected so if you are a um, Chloe, if you are a TrueFit registered member and you are on Ralph Lauren and you answer a sort of a series of very quick sort of questions, it's about sort of um, under 20 seconds, you are then given a one to one recommendation specific to you. And then if you then go over to Bowdoin and you go on to dresses, product page. Um, And because we work with Bowdoin, we would recognize you via your sort of um, anonymized profile sort of ID. And we would instantly give you a size recommendation personal to you without having to go through the, you know, the registration or or sort of answering those questions again. So the the amazing thing with being in in this network is that the data really supports the customer on his, her, their journey within the, the retailers and the brand's platforms. But then also from a retailer and brand, you have access to see so much data about that customer as well that can really help drive a stronger understanding of who that customer actually is and you know and all these things that will really help to inform and make sure that the experience that you are showing the customer is specific to them and really personalized personalization is is a real buzzword that's been in the industry for so long and we know that really the industry hasn't been personalized. Now, I think is the time where, you know, momentum is right. And um, in, the customer knows what they want as well. They have, you know, even more of a sort of understanding of best practice and the experience that they want. And they're, they're even more demanding and rightly so that um, that now is the time to, you know, to start meeting the customer where they are because the customer is the person now who is the disruptor in the industry, as I keep saying. You know, they're, they're the ones who um, have all the choice. So it's no longer the um, that sort of master-servant relationship that the, the industry had with the customer where we could sell the customer pretty much anything because it was only via the physical stores that they had to go in at a certain time within certain sort of days of the week. Now the customer can shop when, whatever time, on whichever device. And there's so much more transparency, which for me is a really exciting position to be in. I love that phrase, the customer is the disruptor in the industry, because I think it's them who are pushing us and the businesses that are going to succeed over the next five to 10 years are those who actually listen. Um, Which brings me on to my next question, because I always think when you're amassing a big data set, the, the thing it does, as you've outlined, is brilliant because it helps solve, you know, improve the customer experience before the product even arrives. But there's always that opportunity of what else can we do with that data and what we analyze and analyze out of it. So are there some some interesting ways at the moment you're seeing retailers take the knowledge you're able to give them to improve their businesses on a larger scale? Yeah. So we have just started working with JD Sports. And JD Sports have implemented the true fit size recommendation on their product listing page. It's pretty much the first retailer in the UK to do it. And this is really where it gets to thinking like a customer in terms of what removes consideration, what will make the customer's journey simpler and more um, and more likely to, to come back and shop again. What we find within TrueFit is we turn regular TrueFit shoppers into Uber shoppers. And that's because when the customer starts to sort of get used to the recommendations, there's a trust element that's, um, you know, that's created. 
and they go back more frequently to that um, that retailer and the brand, and they they shop more frequently. They shop their AOVs are are higher, so they become Uber shoppers. What that means then is the data that the retailer and the brand has on the customer is far greater. It means that you can really understand which groups and cohorts you need to be communicating with on the various different social platforms because you know it's about understanding what each of those platforms is there to deliver and to which customer groups and segments. So there's a there's a huge potential for combining your data with the other data to find the sweet spots I suppose in the customers and, and what's going to move them to buy more. Absolutely. That's what really I find really exciting about where we're going um, for 2022. And I think it's fair to say that digitalization from a retailer's perspective was something that was in the future, in the sense that, you know, pre-2020, we were really anticipating to start seeing a, a sort of this spike from a customer adoption towards digital in around 2024. This sort of came, was brought forward at rapid pace for obvious reasons. I'm not going to sort of, um, you know, we, we've all sort of lived and breathed that experience. So now we, uh, retailers and brands were playing catch up with regards to dependent on where they were on their digital transformation. So what we find now is that many of those retailers and brands have essentially played, you know, they, they've caught up with the foundations of what where they want to go. But now it's about sort of, you know, looking at different sort of elements to really refine the experience and move towards giving customers this really exciting and personalized experience where you don't have to scroll through you know hundreds and hundreds of dresses to to find the the styles that you like because you know the the systems will be able to know and understand and recognize you and therefore see from your your historic data and your historic habits but also attach a little bit of uh, propensity modeling and predictive modeling into um, into sort of anticipating what you're going to want next e-commerce master plan is supported by some of the greatest companies in the e-commerce sector here's a reminder of who they are Getting an online business off the ground isn't easy. So if you find yourself working late, tackling a to-do list that's a mile long with your fifth cup of coffee by your side, remember, great email doesn't have to be complicated. That's what Clavio is for. It's the email and SMS platform built to help e-commerce brands earn more money by creating genuine customer relationships. Get started with a free account at clavio.com forward slash master plan. That's K-L-A-V iyo.com slash masterplan. Shopware is a leading e-commerce system and used by some of the largest European brands, retailers and manufacturers across B2C and B2B industries. As a trend-setting open source solution, Shopware gives retailers the freedom to quickly and easily realise their growth potential with more flexibility and less complexity. Today, more than 100,000 companies from startups to enterprise rely on a Shopware solution, generating a combined turnover of 12 billion euros in 2020 alone. Start your business for free and visit www.shopware.com forward slash masterplan. It's time for the top tips round. Now, I love this section because it gives me and our listeners some really quick ideas for taking our business to the next level. So, Sarah, are you ready for the top tips? Absolutely. Far away. Okay. The book top tip. If everyone listening to this podcast agreed to take Friday off and read a book to make their business better, which book would you recommend? Okay. So, This book was recommended by my chief revenue officer in in the States. It's called Range. It's by David Epstein. Essentially, uh, the premise is why generalists triumph in a um, specialized world. This book is so of the moment, is so specific to 
sectors that are going through huge transformation, it's absolutely well worth a read. I've always felt like I'm a bit of a human sponge. And essentially, the premise of this book is we're much stronger as leaders if we have um, experienced different areas of the sector that in which we work and versus, you know, the the sort of the specialized narrowing of, of focus. So I loved it. I, it's brilliant. And I'm a big believer in having a day a week where, you know, you try and focus on, you know, do reading, take taking time to think essentially is always really important. Oh, you you agree with me. I like that. And that sounds like an excellent book as well, especially in these these changing times. I think it's ever more important to spend a bit more time on the self-development side of things, on the on the bigger thinking. And that book sounds like it totally fits the brief. Okay. The traffic top tip. Which marketing method do you either prize above all others or think doesn't get the press it deserves? One thing that was always a really strong driver of revenue and sales, which ultimately, let's face it, is always the name of the game, was product placement within print and from from you know what's deemed to be unbiased and knowledgeable authorities within, you know, the fashion world or fashion space. So I've always, I was always a real believer and champion of, you know, that product placement in magazines and sort of driving eyeballs to certain products. The challenge is that, you know, when you have a huge catalogue, that is, um, is very hard to do. But the customers love being guided and you know and shown best picks so you know i think the ultimate has got to be you know the not so much the social influencers i'm not interested in social influencers i prefer the authority influencers so these are people who have a presence on social media but actually they are known for an authority, you know, for, for their talent in their own right, i.e. they're, a, you know, a sports person or a business person or whatever it might be, an author. And customers tend to really sort of um, lap up what these people are saying. So it's about talking to fewer people, but driving much stronger engagement and ultimately sales, therefore. Excellent. And your second one? So I I think what's going to be really interesting is um, I'm always a believer, particularly in f- with fashion, that customers are still driven by that impulse. You know, we have seen it work with Instagram, without a doubt. Social shopping has transformed um, the many people's marketing strategy. I think what's a really interesting one to look out for is Pinterest. At some point, that model has got to turn around and and find its sort of its footing and work. It's I'm starting to see that it's becoming much more of a shopping platform now, which is wasn't before. It was all about inspiration. So I think that's going to be a in, really interesting one to watch in terms of where to go. And I'm I'm a true believer of go where there's less noise. Pinterest, without doubt, has many many engaged sort of users who are all extremely aesthetically driven and impulse driven. So that for me, I think is one that's going to be seeing sort of great sort of um, acceleration and sort of 22, 23 and beyond. Nice. Something for us all to go and swat up on. Um, Sarah, the tool top tip, maybe a collaboration tool, a social media plugin, a phone app, or just a way of working. Is there a cool little tool you use that makes you and your team more efficient day to day? Yeah. And and this is one that sort of has been born out of the move out of the office and everyone working from home. And the fact that within TrueFit, you know, we are even within the EU, everyone's working from home and then within the US the same. And so you've got sort of there is no one place to get heads together. So I love things like Trello, which allows you to really sort of start to see projects 
in terms of um, action and what's left to do. And it's just so much more transparent. You know, again, Slack is one that I think is, um, I, I never used Slack before until I joined um, Truefit. We didn't sort of, we weren't using it at Shop Direct. I know I'm, you know, probably really late to the party, but I love those efficiency and team, I guess, team project tools that can, that mean that you don't have to be standing next to each other in order to not lose momentum. Two excellent recommendations. Uh, The growth top tip then, if you met someone today who's focused on growing their e-commerce business from 100 orders per month to 1,000, what would be your number one tip for them? It has to be, uh, it all starts with who is your customer. That might seem like a really obvious question, but when it comes, again, I can only premise this with my experience from a retail fashion perspective. We have been previously so obsessed with trying to be all things to all people, which is why it created such blandness in experience and range. Um, And, you know, it also led to the industry being overstocked for many, many years, which led to so much markdown and discounts being sort of in market to incentivize shoppers. You stand much stronger success of getting to your target um, with a group of really loyal shoppers and customers who are absolute brand champions of yours versus the spray and pray, which I absolutely hate because that is just completely inefficient. The other good thing about last year is that it drove us as a retail sector to really look at the spend that we were pumping into from a, an acquisition perspective, customer acquisition. For me, the most efficient thing that you can do is you you it's about looking at retention. How can you make sure that you convert your one-time shopper to a two-time shopper to an Uber shopper? How can you make them sort of come back time and time again? And so that's where I really feel very passionate about in terms of, you know, driving your growth doesn't have to be in these, you know, huge numbers. It can in terms of, you know, the customer stats and um, uh, numbers of of new customers. It can be just by having an extremely obsessive fan base. So for me, you know, the way you get from 100 to whatever your chosen number is, you drive efficiency and you optimize retention in the customer and you you sweat them because you've already purchased, you've already paid for that customer. Um, you get bang for your buck through um, through the, uh, the return on the investment and you convert that customer into an absolute uber obsessive shopper, obviously, you know, healthily. <laughs> yeah, definitely healthily. And and Sarah, it does strike me that this kind of reflects back to a lot of what we've been talking about today, which is it's an awful lot easier to get customers buying again and again and again from you if you've helped them buy the right product in the first place. So before we say goodbye, could you please let the listeners know where they can find you and Truefit on the web and social media, please? Absolutely. So the URL is www.truefit or one word.com. And we've got some case studies. Um, you can request a live demo. There's sort of a, it gives you a whole sort of background around the genome and what we do. And also uh, feel free to go to LinkedIn and also sort of request further information. We've also just released some really interesting sort of category trends from this year, um, which we'll be sort of posting on LinkedIn. So this uh, it's the rise of the digital shopper. And, you know, that's a PDF that you can download is some really interesting sort of data um, and trends from uh, globally that, that we've we found over the last sort of uh, few months. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, Thank you so much for being on the podcast too and for being so generous, sharing so much insight with us. It's been a real pleasure chatting to you. 
Oh, well, thank you so much for um, for inviting me. I'm always, um, I'm you know, I always sort of uh, love talking um, about the the industry. I'm such a fan, but it's it's a ch- it's been a challenging period. So I'm a true believer in um, in supporting one another. So lots for you to think about there, whether you're in fashion or not, just how do we better understand our customer to bring them an ever better performance? If you are particularly interested in um, Pinterest and learning up on that, we have a couple of episodes we've done in the past about Pinterest, most recently over on our sister podcast, Keep Optimizing. So we will add that into the notes that we produce for today's show, which include the top tips um, and links to other things we've mentioned. You can find all of that at ecommercemasterplan.com forward slash podcast. Find uh, the page for this episode and you'll find the details on there. There you can also add yourself to our email list so you don't miss out on any of the other things I share to help you improve your business. Thank you so much for tuning into this and every episode of the e-commerce master plan podcast. I bring you a new interview every week because I want to inspire and help e-commerce business owners to succeed and thrive with their business. So if you know someone this show can help, please, please ask them to listen to the e-commerce master plan podcast. I hope you have a great week. Keep optimizing. Thank you for listening to the e-commerce master plan podcast. Find out more at ecommercemasterplan.com slash podcast.